Once they kept fire alive at night, a group of Habilines in a particular place occasionally dropped food morsels by accident, ate them after they had been heated and learned that way they tasted better. Repeating their habit, this group would have swiftly evolved into the first Homo erectus. The newly delicious cooked diet led to their evolving smaller guts, bigger brains, bigger bodies and reduced body hair. More running, more hunting, longer lives, calmer temperaments and a new emphasis on bonding between females and males. The softness of their cooked plant foods selected for smaller teeth, the protection fire provided at night enabled them to sleep on the ground and lose their climbing ability and females likely began cooking for males whose time was increasingly free to search for more meat and honey. While other Habilines elsewhere in Africa continued for several hundred thousand years to eat their food raw, one lucky group became Homo erectus and humanity began. Today I will be reading to you my highlights of Catching Fire – How Cooking Made Us Human written by Richard Wrangham. The Cooking Hypothesis The record of our humanity dwindles until around two million years ago when it gives way to pre-human ancestors and leaves us with a question that every culture answers in a different way, but only science can truly decide. What made us human? I believe the transformative moment that gave rise to the genus Homo, one of the great transitions in the history of life, stemmed from the control of fire and the advent of cooked meals. Cooking increased the value of our food. It changed our bodies, our brains, our use of time, and our social lives. The fossil record shows that before our ancestors came to look like us, they were human-like in walking upright, but mostly they had the characteristics of non-human apes. We call them Australopithecines. Australopithecines were the size of chimpanzees, they climbed well, they had ape-sized bellies, and they had protruding ape-like muzzles. Their brains too were barely larger than those of chimpanzees. Old bones continue the story. By around 2.3 million years ago, the first tentative record emerges of a new species, a Hebeline. Hebelines appear to have been about the same small size as Australopithecines and had long arms and jutting faces, leading some people to call them apes. Yet they are thought to be the knife makers and they had brains twice as big as those of living non-human apes, so others placed them in the genus Homo and thereby call them human. In short, they show a mixture of pre-human and human characteristics. After the Habilines emerged, it took hundreds of thousands of years for the evolutionary gears to start turning rapidly again, but between 1.9 million and 1.8 million years ago, the second critical step was taken. Some Habilines evolved into Homo erectus. Homo erectus looked much more like us than any prior species. They are considered to have walked and run as fluently as we do today with the same characteristic stride that we have. So the question of our origins concerns the forces that sprung Homo erectus from their Australopithecine past. Australop <laughs> Anthropologists have an answer. According to the most popular view since the 1950s, there was a single supposed impetus the eating of meat. Chimpanzees readily grab monkeys, piglets or small antelopes when opportunities arise, but weeks or even months can go by with no meat in their diets. Among primates we are the only dedicated carnivores and the only ones to take meat from large carcasses. Some people think the Habilines might have been primarily scavengers while Homo erectus were more proficient hunters. The idea is plausible though archaeological data do not directly test it. But it does not solve a key problem concerning the anatomy of Homo erectus, which had small jaws and small teeth that were poorly adapted for eating the tough raw meat of game animals. These weaker mouths cannot be explained by Homo erectus becoming better at hunting. Something else must have been going on. How lucky that Earth has fire! Hot, dry plant material does this amazing thing, it burns. In a world full of rocks, animals and living plants, dry combustible wood gives us warmth and light, without which our species would be forced to live like other animals. It is easy to forget what life would have been like without fire. 
The nights would be cold, dark, and dangerous, forcing us to wait helplessly for the sun. All our food would be raw. No wonder we find comfort by our hearth. Survival manuals tell us that if we are lost in the wild, one of our first actions should be to make a fire. In addition to warmth and light, fire gives us hot food, safe water, dry clothes, protection from dangerous animals, a signal to friends, and even a sense of inner comfort. In modern society, fire might be hidden from our view, tidied away in the basement boiler, trapped in the engine block of a car, or confined in the power station that drives the electrical grid, but we still completely depend on it. Animals need food, water and shelter. We humans need all those things, but we need fire too. The control of fire was just another way for an unchanged body with an adept mental faculty to respond to a natural challenge. Quote, when he migrates into a colder climate, he uses clothes, builds, sheds and makes fires, and by the aid of fire, cooks food otherwise indigestible. The lower animals, on the other hand, must have their bodily structure modified in order to survive under greatly changed conditions." Unquote. Little change has occurred in human anatomy since the time of Homo erectus almost two million years ago. Culture is the trump card that enables humans to adapt, and compared to the two million year human career, most cultural innovation has indeed been recent. Cooked food does many familiar things. It makes our food safer, creates rich and delicious tastes, and reduces spoilage. Heating can allow us to open, cut, or mash tough foods, but none of these advantages is as important as a little appreciated aspect. Cooking increases the amount of energy our bodies obtain from our food. The extra energy gave the first cooks biological advantages. They survived and reproduced better than before. Their genes spread. Their bodies responded by biologically adapting to cooked food, shaped by our natural selection to take maximum advantage of the new diet. There were changes in anatomy, physiology, ecology, life history, psychology and society. Fossil evidence indicates that this dependence arose not just some tens of thousands of years ago or even a few hundred thousand, but right back at the beginning of our time on Earth, at the start of human evolution, by the Hebeline that became Homo erectus. Quest for raw foodists. Animals thrive on raw diets. Can humans do the same? Conventional wisdom has always assumed so and the logic seems obvious. Animals live off raw food and humans are animals, so humans should fare well on raw foods. Many foods are perfectly edible raw, from apples, tomatoes and oysters to steak tartare and various kinds of fish. Are we just an ordinary animal that happens to enjoy the tastes and securities of cooked food without in any way depending on them? Or are we a new kind of species tied to the use of fire by our biological needs, relying on cooked food to supply enough energy to our bodies? No serious scientific tests have been designed to resolve this problem. Raw foodists are dedicated to eating 100% of their diets raw, or as close to 100% as they can manage. There are only three studies of their body weight and all find that people who eat raw tend to be thin. However, among people who eat cooked diets, there is no difference in body weight between vegetarians and meat eaters. When our food is cooked, we get as many calories from a vegetarian diet as from a typical American meat rich diet. It is only when eating raw that we suffer poor weight gain. To judge whether the energy shortage experienced by raw foodists is biologically significant, we need to know whether raw induced weight loss interferes with critical functions, ideally for a population living under conditions similar to those in our evolutionary past. In the Giesen study, the more raw food that women ate, the lower their body mass index and the more likely they were to have partial or total amenorrhea. Among women eating totally raw diets, about 50% entirely ceased to menstruate. A further proportion, about 10%, suffered irregular menstrual cycles that left them unlikely to conceive. These figures are far higher than for women eating cooked food. Healthy women on cooked diets rarely fail to menstruate, whether or not they are vegetarian. But ovarian function predictably declines in women suffering from extreme energy depletion, such as marathoners and anorexics. 
Westra believed that seminal emissions are designed to remove toxins from the body. After a few weeks of a raw diet, he said, the intake of toxins had fallen to the point where ejaculation was no longer necessary. In a similar way, some raw foodists regard menstruation as a mechanism for removing toxins and therefore regard its cessation as a sign of the health of their diets. Perhaps it is unnecessary to note that medical science finds no support for the idea that toxins are removed by seminal emissions or menstruation. Reduced reproductive function means that in our evolutionary past, raw foodism would have been much less successful than the habit of eating cooked food. A rate of infertility greater than 50%, such as was found in the Giesen raw food study, would be devastating in a natural population of foragers. Quote unquote delicious means high energy because what people like are foods with low levels of indigestible fiber and high levels of soluble carbohydrates, such as sugars. Agricultural improvements have rendered fruits in a supermarket, such as apples, bananas, and strawberries, far higher in quality than their wild ancestors. In our laboratory at Harvard, nutritional biochemist Nancy Lou Conklin Britton finds that carrots contain as much sugar as the average wild fruit eaten by a chimpanzee in Kibali National Park in Uganda. But even carrots are better quality than a typical wild tropical fruit because they have less fiber and fewer toxic compounds. Energy shortages were also universal in archaeological populations. Until the development of agriculture, it was the human fate to suffer regular periods of hunger, typically it seems for several weeks a year, even though they ate their food cooked. Many follow the pseudoscientific ideas of vegetarian Edward Howell, who theorized in a 1946 book that plants contain quote-unquote living or active enzymes, which if eaten raw operate for our benefit inside our bodies. His followers, therefore, prepare their foods below a certain temperature, normally about 45 to 48 degrees centigrade, 113 to 116 degrees Fahrenheit, above which the life force of the enzymes is supposedly destroyed. To scientists, the idea that food enzymes contribute to digestion or cellular function in our bodies is nonsense, because these molecules are themselves digested in our stomachs and small intestines. The living enzyme idea also ignores that even if food enzymes survived our digestive systems, their own specific metabolic functions are too specialized to allow them to do anything useful in our bodies. Eating raw intrudes into social life, demands a lot of time in the kitchen, and requires a strong will to resist the thought of cooked food. It can create personal problems, such as annoyingly frequent urination, and for meat eaters it increases the risk of eating toxins or pathogens that would be destroyed by cooking. There are other health risks too. Recent studies indicate that low bone mass in the backs and hips of raw foodists was caused by their raw diet. Raw diets are also associated with low levels of vitamin B12, low levels of HDL cholesterol, the good cholesterol, and elevated levels of homocysteine, a suspected risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Cooking was practiced by every known human society. Similarly, all around the world are societies that tell of their ancestors having lived without fire. When anthropologist James Fraser examined reports of prehistoric firelessness, he found them equally full of fantasy, such as fire uh, being brought by a cockatoo or being tamed after it was discovered in a woman's genitals. The control of fire and the practice of cooking are human universals. Everywhere we look, home cooking is the norm. For most foods, eating raw appears to be a poor alternative demanded by circumstance. With abundant food, people can survive well on a raw, animal-based diet for at least a month. But people sometimes survive with no food at all for a month, provided they have water. The lack of any evidence for longer-term survival on raw, wild food suggests that even in extremis, people need their food cooked. Raw foodists, it is clear, do not fare well. They thrive only in rich and modern environments where they depend on eating exceptionally high-quality foods. Animals do not have the same constraints. They flourish on wild raw foods. The suspicion prompted by the shortcomings of the Evo diet is correct, and the implication is clear. There is something odd about us. We are not like other animals. In most circumstances, need cooked food. The cook's body 
Evolutionary trade-offs are common. Compared to chimpanzees, we climb badly, but we walk well. Our awkwardness in trees is due partly to our having long legs and flat feet, but those same legs and feet enable us to walk more efficiently than other apes. In a similar way, our limited effectiveness at digesting raw food is due to our having relatively small digestive systems compared to those of our cousin apes. But the reduced size of our digestive systems, it seems, enables us to process cooked food with exceptional proficiency. Cooked food promotes efficient growth. The spontaneous benefits of cooked food explain why domesticated pets easily become fat. Their food is cooked, such as the commercially produced kibbles, pellets and nuggets given to dogs and cats. Whether domestic or wild, mammal or insect, useful or pest, animals adapted to raw diets tend to fare better on cooked food. In humans, because we have adapted to cooked food, its spontaneous advantages are complemented by evolutionary benefits. The evolutionary benefits stem from the fact that digestion is a costly process that can account for a high proportion of an individual's energy budget, often as much as locomotion does. After our ancestors started eating cooked food every day, natural selection favored those with small guts, because they were able to digest their food well, but at a lower cost than before. The result was increased energetic efficiency. Evolutionary benefits of adapting to cooked foods are evident from comparing human digestive systems with those of chimpanzees and other apes. The main differences all involve humans having relatively small features. We have small mouths, weak jaws, small teeth, small stomachs, small colons, and small guts overall. Humans have an astonishingly tiny opening for such a large species. All great apes have a prominent snout and a wide grin. Chimpanzees can open their mouths twice as far as humans as they regularly do when eating. The difference in mouth size is even more obvious when we take the lips into account. The amount of food a chimpanzee can hold in its mouth far exceeds what humans can do, because in addition to their wide gape and big mouths, chimpanzees have enormous and very muscular lips. Humans have relatively tiny lips, appropriate for a small amount of food in the mouth at one time. Our small, weak jaw muscles are not adapted for chewing tough raw food, but they work well for soft cooked food. Human chewing teeth, or molars, are also small, the smallest of any primate species in relation to body size. Our stomachs, again, are comparatively small. In humans, the surface area of the stomach is less than one-third the size expected for a typical mammal of our body weight, and smaller than in 97% of other primates. The high caloric density of cooked food suggests that our stomachs can afford to be small. Great apes eat perhaps twice as much by weight per day as we do because their foods are packed with indigestible fiber. The human small intestine is only a little smaller than expected from the size of our bodies, reflecting that this organ is the main site of digestion and absorption, and humans have the same basal metabolic rate as other primates in relation to body weight. But the large intestine, or colon, is less than 60% of the mass that would be expected for a primate of our body weight. The colon is where our intestinal flora ferment plant fiber, producing fatty acids that are absorbed into the body and used for energy. That the colon is relatively small in humans means we cannot retain as much fiber as the great apes can, and therefore cannot utilize plant fiber as effectively for food. Our small mouths, teeth and guts fit well with the softness, high caloric density, low fiber content and high digestibility of cooked food. The reduction increases efficiency and saves us from wasting unnecessary metabolic costs on features whose only purpose would be to allow us to digest large amounts of high fiber food. Carnivores such as dogs and probably wolves and hyenas also tend to have small guts compared to those of great apes, including small colons that are efficient for the high caloric density and low fiber density of a meat diet. But despite these hints of humans being designed for meat eating, our mouths, teeth and jaws are clearly not well adapted to eating meat unless it has been cooked. If our mouths, 
teeth, jaws, and stomachs all indicate that humans are not adapted to eating lumps of raw meat, they might, in theory, be designed to digest meat that has been processed without being cooked. If the meat-eating hypothesis is advanced to explain why Homo erectus had small teeth and guts, it faces a difficulty with the plant component of the diet. It cannot explain how a human with a diminished capacity for digestion could have digested plant foods efficiently. Plants are a vital food because humans need large amounts of either carbohydrates from plant foods or fat found in a few animal foods. Without carbohydrates or fat, people depend on protein for their energy and excessive protein induces a form of poisoning. Symptoms of protein poisoning include toxic levels of ammonia in the blood, damage to the liver and kidneys, dehydration, loss of appetite, and ultimately death. Because the maximum safe level of protein intake for humans is around 50% of total calories, the rest must come from fat, such as blubber, or carbohydrates, such as in fruits and roots. Fat is an excellent source of calories in high-latitude sites like the Arctic or Tierra del Fuego, where sea mammals have evolved thick layers of blubber to protect themselves from the cold. However, fat levels are much lower in the meat of tropical mammals, averaging around 4%, and high-fat tissues like marrow and brain are always in limited supply. If early humans had the same small guts as we do, they could have not obtained their planned carbohydrates without cooking. If our early human ancestors indeed ate their plant food raw, they would have needed to find ways of processing it that were superior to our modern technology. But it is not credible that Stone Age people developed non-thermal methods of food preparation more effective than using an electric blender. Cooking would have created some toxins, reduced others, and probably favored adjustments to our digestive enzymes. Very little is known about how our detoxification system and enzyme chemistry differ from those of great apes, but studies should eventually provide further tests of the hypothesis that human bodies are adapted to eating cooked foods. Take for example Maillard compounds, such as heterocyclic amines and acrylamide. These complex molecules are formed from, from a process that begins with the union of sugars and amino acids, particularly lysine. Maillard compounds occur naturally in our bodies and increase in frequency with age. They occur at low concentration in natural foods, but under the influence of heat, their concentration becomes much higher than what is found in nature. Maillard compounds cause mutations in bacteria and are suspected of leading to some human cancers. They can also induce a chronic state of inflammation, a process that raw foodists invoke to explain why they feel better on raw diets. Evolutionary adaptation to cooking might likewise explain why humans seem less prepared to tolerate toxins than do other apes. The shifts in food preference between chimpanzees and humans suggest that our species has a reduced physiological tolerance for foods high in toxins or tannins. Since cooking predictably destroys many toxins, we may have evolved a relatively sensitive palate by contrast, if we were adapted to a raw meat diet, we would expect to see evidence of resistance to the toxins produced by bacteria that live on meat. No such evidence is known. Even when we cook our meat, we are vulnerable to bacterial infections. The best prevention is to cook meat, fish and eggs beyond 140 degrees Fahrenheit or 60 degrees centigrade and not to eat foods containing unpasteurized milk or eggs. The cooking hypothesis suggests that because our ancestors have typically been able to cook their meat, humans have remained vulnerable to bacteria that live on raw meat. Certainly meat eating has been an important factor in human evolution and nutrition, but it has had less impact on our bodies than cooked food. We fare poorly on raw diets, no cultures rely on them, and adaptations in our bodies explain why we cannot easily utilize raw foods. Even vegetarians thrive on cooked diets. We are cooks more than carnivores. The energy theory of cooking. Cooking has important effects in changing water content and reducing the concentration of vitamins, but the density of calories supposedly remains unchanged whether food is eaten raw or is roasted, grilled or boiled. This conclusion is very puzzling. Obviously, it conflicts with the abundant evidence that humans and animals get more energy from cooked foods. 
The mechanisms increasing energy gain in cooked food compared to raw food are reasonably well understood. Most important, cooking gelatinizes starch, denatures protein, and softens everything. As a result of these and other processes, cooking substantially increases the amount of energy we obtain from our food. Studies of ileal digestibility show that we use cooked starch very efficiently. The percentage of cooked starch that has been digested by the time it reaches the end of the ileum is at least 95% in oats, wheat, potatoes, plantains, bananas, cornflakes, white bread, and the typical European or American diet, a mixture of starchy foods, dairy products, and meat. A few foods have lower digestibility. Starch in home-cooked kidney beans and flaked barley has an ileal digestibility of only around 84%, Comparable measurements of the ileal digestibility of raw starch are much lower. Ileal digestibility is 71% for wheat starch, 51% for potatoes, and a measly 48% for raw starch in plantains and cooking bananas. The differences conform to test tube studies of a wide range of items, showing that raw starch is poorly digested, often only half as well as cooked starch. Starch granules eaten raw frequently pass through the ileum whole and enter the colon unchanged from when they were eaten. This resistant starch is vivid testimony to the deficits of a raw starch diet, explaining why we like our starch cooked and contributing to the weight loss that raw foodists experience. The principal way cooking achieves its increased digestibility is by gelatinization. Starch inside plant cells come as dense little packages of stored glucose called granules. The granules are less than a tenth of a millimeter, four thousandths of an inch, long, too small to be seen with the naked eye or to be damaged by the milling of flour, and they are so stable that in a dry environment they can persist for tens of thousands of years. However, as starch granules are warmed up in the presence of water, they start to swell, at around 58 degrees centigrade in the case of wheat starch, a well-studied and representative example. The granules swell because hydrogen bonds in the glucose polymers weaken when they are exposed to heat, and this causes the tight crystalline structure to loosen. By 90 degrees centigrade still, below boiling, the granules are disrupted into fragments. At this point the glucose chains are unprotected and gelatinized. Starch does not necessarily stay gelatinized after being cooked. In day-old bread, the starch reverts and becomes resistant. This might help explain why we like to toast bread after it has lost its initial freshness. Gelatinization happens whenever starch is cooked. As long as water is present, even from the dampness of a fresh plant, the more that starch is cooked, the more it is gelatinized. The more starch is gelatinized, the more easily enzymes can reach it, and therefore the more completely it is digested. Thus, cooked starch yields more energy than raw. Cooking consistently increases the glycemic index of starchy foods. The effects of cooking on the energy derived from eating meat have never been formally investigated, particularly the effects due to meat's complex structure. Even the effects on proteins are a matter of debate. Until recently, some scientists, such as David Jenkins, saw cooking as reducing protein digestibility. Others claim cooking protein is beneficial or has no effect. Recent studies of the digestion of eggs are starting to resolve the argument, showing for the first time that cooked protein is digested much more completely than raw protein. Raw eggs would seem to provide an excellent food supply, not only because their protein needs no chewing, but also because their chemical composition is ideal. The amino acids of chicken eggs come in about 40 proteins in almost exactly the proportions humans require. Raw eggs have other natural advantages. Their shells make them safer from bacteria contamination than cuts of meat. Eggs are the only unprocessed animal food that can safely be stored at room temperature for several weeks. But even though eggs appear to be both high quality and relatively safe when eaten raw, hunter-gatherers prefer to cook them. When the eggs were cooked, the proportion of protein digested averaged 91% to 94%. This high figure 
was much as expected, given that egg protein is known to be an excellent food. However, in the ileostomy patients, digestibility of raw eggs was measured at a meager 51%. 35% to 49% of the ingested protein was leaving the small intestine undigested. Cooking increased the protein value of eggs by around 40%. The major factor was denaturation of the food proteins induced by heat. Denaturation occurs when the internal bonds of a protein weaken, causing the molecule to open up. As a result, the protein molecule loses its original three-dimensional structure and therefore its natural biological function. The gastroenterologists noted that heat predictably denatures proteins and that denatured proteins are more digestible because their open structure exposes them to the action of digestive enzymes. Heat is only one of several factors that promote denaturation. Three others are acidity, sodium chloride and drying, all of which humans use in different ways. Our empty stomachs are highly acidic thanks to the secretions of a billion acid-producing cells that line the stomach wall and secrete 1 to 2 liters of hydrochloric acid a day. Food entering the stomach buffers the acidity and causes a more neutral pH, but the stomach cells respond rapidly and secrete enough acid to return the stomach to its original intense low pH, less than 2. This intense acidity has at least three functions. It kills bacteria that enter with the food, activates the digestive enzyme pepsin, and denatures proteins. Denaturation looks particularly important. Wagyu cattle are one of the most expensive breeds in the world because their meat is exceptionally tender and no effort is spared to make it so. The animals are raised on a diet that includes beer and grain and their muscles are regularly massaged with sake, the Japanese rice wine. The fat in the meat is claimed to melt at room temperature. The exceptional value of Wagyu beef illustrates a notable human pattern. People like their meat tender. The first of six reasons for cooking was to render mastication easy. Quote, hurrying over our meals as we do, we should fare badly if all the grinding and subdividing of human food had to be accomplished by human teeth. Unquote. A second reason for cooking stressed the point Beaumont had discovered to facilitate and hasten digestion. While some foods are naturally tender, meat is variable. Meat with smaller muscle fibers is more tender, so chicken is more tender than beef. An animal slaughtered without being stressed retains more glycogen in its muscles. After death, the glycogen converts to lactic acid, which promotes denaturation and therefore a more tender meat. Carcasses that are left to hang for several days are more tender because proteins are partly broken down by enzymes. Nothing changes meat tenderness as much as cooking because heat has a tremendous effect on the material in meat most responsible for its toughness, connective tissue. Connective tissue is slippery, elastic and strong. The tensile strength of tendons can be half that of aluminum. So connective tissue not only does a wonderful job of keeping our muscles in place, but it also makes meat very difficult to eat, particularly for an animal like humans or chimpanzees, whose teeth are notably blunt. Collagen has an Achilles heel. Heat turns it to jelly. Collagen shrinks when it reaches its denaturation temperature of 60 to 70 degrees centigrade, and then, as the helices start to unwind, it starts melting away. Whether heated about 100 degrees centigrade for a short time or at lower temperatures for a longer time, the fibrils of collagen fall apart until they convert into the very antithesis of toughness, gelatin. The amount of force required to cut through a standard piece of meat tends to reach a minimum between 60 and 70 degrees centigrade. Above those temperatures, slow cooking and water can sometimes continue to increase the tenderness. Unfortunately for the amateur cooks among us, a second effect of heating meat is contrary to the first. Unlike connective tissue, heated muscle fibers tend to get tougher and drier. The cumulative effects of cooking meat are therefore complex. Bad cooking can render meat hard to chew, but good cooking tenderizes every kind of meat. The rats eating soft food slowly became heavier than those eating hard food. On average, 37 grams heavier, or about 6%, and they had more abdominal fat, on average 30% more, enough to be classified as obese. 
Soft, well-processed foods made the rats fat. The difference was in the cost of digestion. At every meal, the rats experienced a rise in body temperature, but the rise was lower in the soft pellet group than in the hard pellet group. The difference was particularly strong in the first hour after eating, when the stomach was actively churning and secreting. The researchers concluded that the reason the softer diet led to obesity was simply that it was a little less costly to digest. If cooking softens food and softer food leads to greater energy gain, then humans should get more energy from cooked food than raw food, not only because of processes such as gelatinization and denaturation, but also because it reduces the cost of digestion. Grinding breaks up both muscle fibers and connective tissue, so it increases the surface area of the digestible parts of the meat. Ground meat is exposed more rapidly to acid, causing denaturation, as well as to proteolytic enzymes, causing degradation of the muscle proteins. Grinding reduced the snake's cost of digestion by 12.3%. Cooking produced almost identical results. Compared to the raw diet, cooked meat led to a reduction in the cost of digestion by 12.7%. The effects of the two experimental treatments, grinding and cooking, were almost entirely independent. Alone, each reduced the cost of digestion by just over 12%. Together, they reduced it by 23.4%. The unnaturally, atypically soft foods that composed the human diet have given our species an energetic edge, sparing us much of the hard work of digestion. Fire does a job our bodies would otherwise have to do. Eat a properly cooked steak and your stomach will more quickly return to quiescence. From starch gelatinization to protein denaturation and the costs of digesting, absorbing and assimilating meat, the same lesson emerges. Cooking gives calories. Admittedly, cooking can have some negative effects. It leads to energy losses through dripping during the cooking process and by producing indigestible protein compounds, and it often leads to a reduction of vitamins. But compared to the energetic gains, those processes do not matter. Overall, it appears that cooking consistently provides more energy, whether from plant or animal food. Cooked food is better than raw food because life is mostly concerned with energy. So from an evolutionary perspective, if cooking causes a loss of vitamins or creates a few long-term toxic compounds, the effect is relatively unimportant compared to the impact of more calories. In subsistence cultures, better fed mothers have more and healthier children. In addition to more offspring, they have greater competitive ability, better survival and longer lives. When cooking began. The archaeological data leave no doubt that controlling fire is an ancient tradition. In the most recent quarter of a million years, there is sparkling evidence of fire control, and even occasionally of cooking, by both our ancestors and our close relatives, the Neanderthals. Sites show that people have been controlling fire throughout the evolutionary lifespan of our species, Homo sapiens, which is considered to have originated about 200,000 years ago. Because evidence about controlling fire is inconsistent before the last quarter of a million years, it is often argued that the control of fire was unimportant or absent until that time. But that idea is now particularly shaky because the older part of the record, going back in time from a quarter of a million years ago, has been improving in quality. Prior to half a million years ago, there is no evidence for the control of fire in Europe, but ice covered Britain for much of the time between 500,000 and 400,000 years ago, and glaciers would have swept away most evidence of any earlier occupations. Farther south, however, fire using is strongly attested at 790,000 years ago. Evidence of humans controlling fire is hard to recover from early times. Meat can be cooked easily without burning bones. Fires might have been small, temporary affairs, leaving no trace within a few days of exposure to wind and rain. The inability of the archaeological evidence to tell when humans first controlled fire directs us to biology, where we find two vital clues. First, the fossil record presents a reasonably clear picture of the changes in human anatomy over the past two million years. It tells us that there were major changes in our ancestors' anatomy and when they happened. 
Second, in response to a major change in diet, species tend to exhibit rapid and obvious changes in their anatomy. Animals are superbly adapted to their diets, and over evolutionary time, the tight fit between food and anatomy is driven by food rather than by the animal's characteristics. Humans do not eat cooked food because we have the right kinds of teeth and guts. Rather, we have small teeth and short guts as a result of adapting to a cooked diet. Therefore, we can identify when cooking began by searching the fossil record. At some time, our ancestors' anatomy changed to accommodate a cooked diet. The change must mark when cooking became not merely an occasional activity, but a predictable daily occurrence. Across the different locations, despite different diets and living conditions, the apes responded similarly. No apes preferred any food raw. They ate sweet potatoes and apples with equal enthusiasm, whether raw or cooked. But they preferred their carrots, potatoes, and meat to be cooked. The chimpanga chimpanzees were particularly informative because there was no record of them having eaten meat previously. Yet they showed a strong preference for cooked meat over raw meat. Why are wild animals pre-adapted in this way to appreciate the smells, tastes, and textures of cooked food? The spontaneous preference for cooked food implies an innate mechanism for recognizing high-energy foods. Many foods change their taste when cooked, becoming sweeter, less bitter, or less astringent. So taste could play a role in this preference, as some evidence suggests. The proximate reasons chimpanzees and many other species like their meat and potatoes cooked may be the same as in humans. We identify foods that have high caloric value not just by their being sweet, but also by their being soft and tender. Our ancestors were surely prepared by their pre-existing sensory and brain mechanisms to like cooked foods in the same way. A long delay between the first control of fire and the first eating of cooked food is therefore deeply improbable. A long delay between the adoption of a major new diet and resulting changes in anatomy is also unlikely. Studies of Galapagos finches by Peter and Rosemary Grant showed that during a year when finches experienced an intense food shortage caused by an extended drought, the birds that were best able to eat large and hard seeds, those birds with the largest beaks, survived best. The selection pressure against small-beaked birds was so intense that only 15% of birds survived, and the species as a whole developed measurably larger beaks within a year. Correlations in beak size between parents and offspring showed that the changes were inherited. Beak size fell again after the food supply returned to normal, but it took about 15 years for the genetic changes the drought had imposed to reverse. Anatomy can evolve very quickly in response to dietary changes. In the case of the drought year in the Galapagos, the change in diet was temporary, and therefore so was the change in anatomy. Other data show that if an ecological change is permanent, the species also changes permanently, and again the transition is fast. Cooked food had multiple differences from raw food. Effects of cooking include extra energy, softer food, fireside meals. A safer and more diverse set of food species, and a more predictable food supply during periods of scarcity. Cooking would therefore be expected to increase survival, especially of the vulnerable young. It should also have increased the range of edible foods, allowing extension into new biogeographical zones. Whenever cooking was adopted, its effects should be easy to find. We can expect the origin of cooking to be signaled by large, rapid changes in human anatomy, appropriate to a softer and more energy-rich diet. The reduction in tooth size, the signs of increased energy availability in larger brains and bodies, the indication of smaller guts, and the ability to exploit new kinds of habitat, all support the idea that cooking was responsible for the evolution of Homo erectus. Even the reduction in climbing ability fits the hypothesis that Homo erectus cooked. Homo erectus presumably climbed no better than modern humans do, unlike the agile habilines. This shift suggests that Homo erectus slept on the ground, a novel behavior that would have depended on their controlling fire to provide light to see predators and scare them away. Primates hardly ever sleep on the ground. 
smaller species sleep in tree holes, in hidden nests, on branches hanging over water, on cliff ledges, or in trees so tall that no ground predator is likely to reach them. Great apes mostly build sleeping platforms or nests. The only non-human primate that regularly sleeps on the ground is the largest species of great ape, gorillas. Chimpanzees take about five minutes to build their nests by standing on all fours where the nest is taking shape, bending branches toward themselves. They break some of the bigger ones and weave the branches together to form a platform that they finish off with a few leafy twigs that serve as cushions or pillows to make it comfortable. Making a nest depends on being able to move around easily on the end of a swaying branch. The long legs and flat feet of humans such as Homo erectus and modern people do not allow such agility. Homo erectus therefore must have slept on the ground, but to do so in the dark of a moonless night seems impossibly dangerous. If Homo erectus used fire, however, they could sleep in the same way as people do nowadays in the savannah. In the bush, people lie close to the fire and for most or all of the night someone is awake. When a sleeper awakens, he or she might poke at the fire and chat a while, allowing another to fall asleep. In a 12-hour night with no light other than what the fire provides, there is no need to have a continuous 8-hour sleep. An informal system of guarding easily emerges that allows enough hours of sleep for all, while ensuring the presence of an alert sentinel. Having controlled fire, a group of Habilines learned that they could sleep safely on the ground. Their new practice of cooking roots and meat meant that food obtained from trees was less important than it had been when raw food was the only option. When they no longer needed to climb trees to find food or sleep safely, natural selection rapidly favored the anatomical changes that facilitated long-distance locomotion and led to living completely on the ground. For more than 2.5 million years, our ancestors have been cutting meat off animal bones and the impact was huge. A diet that included raw meat as well as plant foods pushed our forebears out of the Australopithecine rut, initiated the evolution of their larger brains and probably inspired a series of food processing innovations. But according to the evidence carried in our bodies, it would take the invention of cooking to convert Hebelines into Homo erectus and launch the journey that has led without any major changes to the anatomy of modern humans. Brain Foods In the view of many evolutionary anthropologists, the pressure for intelligence indeed comes primarily from the advantages of outwitting social competitors, whereas a major reason for species differences is how much brain power the body can afford. For this reason, the quality of the diet has been identified as a key driver of the growth of primate brains. For humans, cooking must have played a major role. Large brains have evolved because intelligence is a vital component of social life. The hypothesis nicely explains how animals that live in groups can benefit from being clever by outwitting their rivals in competition over mates, food, allies and status. It also explains why species with bigger brains tend to have more complex societies and the hypothesis suggests that if a species has limited brain power, its social options may be constrained as well. Small-brained monkeys may be too dim to handle many social relationships. The advantages are so strong that we might expect all social primates to have developed big brains and high intellect. Yet there is a wide variation. Lemurs are as small-brained as typical mammals. Apes have bigger brains than monkeys. And humans have the biggest brains of all. The social brain hypothesis does not explain these variations. It sets up this problem. If social intelligence is so important, why do some group living species have smaller brains than others? Diet provides a major part of the answer. Brains are exceptionally greedy for glucose, in other words for energy. For an inactive person, every fifth meal is eaten solely to power the brain. Literally, our brains use around 20% of our basal metabolic rate, our energy budget when we are resting, even though they make up only about 2.5% of our body weight. The high rate of energy flow is vital because our neurons need to keep firing whether we are awake or asleep. 
Even a brief interruption in the flow of oxygen or glucose causes neuron activity to stop, leading rapidly to death. The constant energy demand of brain cells continues even when times are tough, such as when food is scarce or an infection is raging. The first requirement for evolving a big brain is the ability to fuel it, and to do so reliably. Basal metabolic rates are well known in primates and other animals, but they are unremarkable in humans. A resting person supplies energy to their body at almost exactly the rate predicted for any primate of our body weight. Since nothing about basal metabolic rates is special to humans, Ayello and Wheeler were able to rule out the idea that our big brains are powered by inordinate amounts of energy passing through the body. Among species that have the same relative basal metabolic rate, such as humans and other primates, extra energy going to the brain must be offset by a reduced amount of energy going elsewhere. The question is, what part of the body is shortchanged? Across the primates, there is substantial variation in the relative weight of the intestinal system. Some species have big guts and some are small. The variation in gut size is linked to the quality of the diet. Mammalian intestines have a high metabolic rate and in large, mostly vegetarian species like great apes, intestines tend to be busy all day, starting with a post-dawn meal and continuing ceaselessly until hours after the animal goes to sleep. All this time the guts are engaged in several energy-intensive functions, such as churning, making stomach acid, synthesizing digestive enzymes, or actively transporting digested molecules across the gut wall and into the blood. Active guts consume calories at a consistently high rate, so their total energy expenditure depends on their weight and on how much work they are doing. In species that are adapted to eating more easily digested foods, such as sugar-rich fruits compared to fibrous leaves, guts are also relatively small. Fruit-eating chimpanzees or spider monkeys have smaller guts than the leaf-eating gorillas or howler monkeys. Those reduced guts use less total energy than larger guts and therefore give a species with a high-quality diet some spare calories to allocate elsewhere in the body. The anthropologists concluded that primates that spend less energy fueling their intestines can afford to power more brain tissue. Big brains are made possible by a reduction in expensive tissue. The idea became known as the expensive tissue hypothesis. Different kinds of trade-offs have also been proposed. Species with relatively low muscle mass have been found to have relatively larger brains. The general lesson is that bigger brains must be paid for somehow. How animals with small guts make use of their energy savings depends on what matters to them. In primates, the tendency to use energy saved by smaller guts for added brain tissue is particularly strong, presumably because most primates live in groups where extra social intelligence has big payoffs. The expensive tissue hypothesis predicted that major rises in human brain size would be associated with increases in diet quality. Chimpanzees do dig for tubers occasionally, sometimes with sticks, and our stratopithecines would have been at least as skillful and well adapted. Their chewing teeth are famously massive and somewhat pig-like, suited to crushing roots and corms. An important location for Australopithecine food sources likely would have been the edges of rivers and lakes, where sedges, water lilies and cattails grow well and provide a natural supermarket of starchy foods for hunter-gatherers today. The underground energy storage organs of plants have a quality anticipated by the expensive tissue hypothesis. They have less indigestible fiber from plant cell walls than foliage, making them easier to digest and therefore a food of higher value. A dietary change from foliage to higher quality roots is thus a plausible explanation for the first increase in brain size, from forest apes to australopithecines 5 million to 7 million years ago. When chimpanzees kill a prey animal, they normally eat such parts as the guts, liver or brain first. They can swallow those quickly. But when eating muscle, chimpanzees are forced to chew it slowly, taking as much as an hour to chew one third of a kilogram, three quarters of a pound. They can get as many calories per hour by chewing fruits as they can by chewing meat. Chimpanzees have a primitive form of processing meat. By adding tree leaves to their meat meals, they make chewing easier. 
After habilines cut hunks of meat off the carcasses of game animals, they may have sliced them into steaks, laid them on flat stones and panned them with logs or rocks. Even relatively crude hammering would have reduced the cost of digestion by tenderizing the meat and breaking connective tissue. Because raw, unprocessed meat is difficult to chew and digest, I suspect this was one of the most important cultural innovations in human origins, enabling habilines to increase the nutritional benefit of meat and the speed with which they could eat and digest it. Given the evidence and arguments I have offered that Homo erectus originated as cooks, the expensive tissue hypothesis suggests their eating cooked food caused their brains to grow. Once cooking began, gut size could fall and the gut would be less active, both trends reducing the cost of the digestive system. Improvements in cooking efficiency could explain why there was a steady upward trend in brain size during the lifetimes of the early human species. Brains were notably bigger in late Homo erectus than in early Homo erectus and in late Homo heidelbergensis than in early Homo heidelbergensis. Major dietary breakthroughs such as meat eating and the invention of cooking cannot account for these smaller changes. The steady rise in brain size between the major jumps is most easily explained by a series of improvements in cooking techniques. Although the breakthrough of using fire at all would have been the biggest culinary leap, the subsequent discovery of better ways to prepare the food would have led to continual increases in digestive efficiency, leaving more energy for brain growth. The improvements would have been especially important for brain growth after birth, since easily digested weaning foods would have been critical contributors to a child's energy supply. Cooking was a great discovery not merely because it gave us better food or even because it made us physically human. It did something even more important. It helped make our brains uniquely large, providing a dull human body with a brilliant human mind. How cooking frees men. The adoption of cooking must have radically changed the way our ancestors ate in ways that would have changed our social behavior too. Take softness. Foods soften when they are cooked and as a result cooked food can be eaten more quickly than raw food. Reliance on cooked food has therefore allowed our species to thoroughly restructure the working day. Instead of chewing for half of their time, as great apes tend to do, women in subsistence societies tend to spend the active part of their days collecting and preparing food. Men, liberated from the simple biological demands of a long day's commitment to chewing raw food, engage in productive or unproductive labor as they wish. In fact, I believe that cooking has made possible one of the most distinctive features of human society, the modern form of the sexual division of labor. Women and men spend their days seeking different kinds of foods and the foods they obtain are eaten by both sexes. Why our species forages in such an unusual way compared to primates and all other animals whose adults do not share food with one another has never been fully resolved. Although the specific food types varied from place to place, women always tended to provide the staples, whether roots, seeds or shellfish. These foods normally needed processing, which could involve a lot of time and laborious work. Even more distinctive of humans is that each sex eats not only from their food items they have collected themselves, but also from their partner's finds. Not even a hint of this complementarity is found among non-human primates. Plenty of primates such as gibbons and gorillas have family groups. Females and males in those species spend all day together, are nice to each other and bring up their offspring together. But unlike people, the adults never give each other food. Human couples by contrast are expected to do so. The division of labor by sex affects both household subsistence and society as a whole. Sociologist Emile Durkheim thought that its most important result was to promote moral standards by creating a bond within the family. Specialization of labor also increases productivity by allowing women and men to become more skilled at their particular tasks, which promotes efficient use of time and resources. It is even thought to be associated with the evolution of some emotional and intellectual skills because our reliance on sharing requires a cooperative temperament and exceptional intelligence. 
The way to explain the evolution of the sexual division of labor is to imagine that, together, meat-eating and plant-eating allowed a household. An unstated assumption was that the food was raw. But if food was raw, the sexual division of labor is unworkable. Nowadays, a man who has spent most of the day hunting can satisfy his hunger easily when he returns to camp because his evening meal is cooked. But if the food waiting for him in camp had all been raw, he would have had a major problem. The difficulty lies in the large amount of time it takes to eat raw food. Chimpanzees in Gombe National Park, Tanzania, spend more than six hours a day chewing. Six hours may seem high, considering that most of their food is ripe fruit. Bananas or grapefruit would slip down their throats easily, and for this reason chimpanzees readily raid the plantations of people living near their territories. But wild fruits are not nearly as rewarding as those domesticated fruits. The edible pulp of a forest fruit is often physically hard, and it may be protected by a skin, coat, or hairs that have to be removed. A few careful studies using direct observation confirm how relatively quickly humans eat their food. In the United States, children from 9 to 12 years of age spend a mere 10% of their time eating, or just over an hour per 12-hour day. Humans devote between a fifth and a tenth as much time to chewing as do the great apes. This reduction in chewing time clearly results from cooked food being softer. Processed plant foods experience similar physical changes to, the, to those of meat. As the food canning industry knows all too well, it is hard to retain a crisp, fresh texture in heated vegetables or fruits. Plant cells are normally glued together by pectic polysaccharides. These chemicals degrade when heated, causing the cells to separate and permitting teeth to divide the tissue more easily. Hot cells also lose rigidity, a result of both their walls swelling and their membranes being disrupted by denaturation of proteins. Six hours of chewing per day for a chimpanzee mother who consumes 1800 calories per day means that she ingests food at a rate of around 300 calories per hour of chewing. Humans comparatively bolt their food. If adults eat 2000 to 2500 calories a day, as many people do, the fact that they chew for only about one hour per day means that their average intake rate will average 2000 to 2500 calories an hour or higher, or more than six times the rate for a chimpanzee. Thanks to cooking, we save ourselves around four hours of chewing time per day. Before our ancestors cooked then, they had much less free time. Their options for subsistence activities would therefore have been severely constrained. These time constraints are inescapable for a large ape or habiline eating raw unprocessed food. Males who did not cook would not have been able to rely on hunting to feed themselves. Like chimpanzees, they could hunt in opportunistic spurts, but if they devoted many hours to hunting, the risk of failure to obtain prey could not be compensated rapidly enough. Eating their daily required calories in the form of their staple plant foods would have taken too long. The use of fire solved the problem. It freed hunters from previous time constraints by reducing the time spent chewing. It also allowed eating after dark. The first of our ancestral line to cook their food would have gained several hours of daytime. Instead of being an opportunistic activity, hunting could have become a more dedicated pursuit with a higher potential for success. Nowadays, men can hunt until nightfall and still eat a large meal in camp. After cooking began, therefore, hunting could contribute to the full development of the family household, reliant as it is on predictable economic exchange between women and men. The Married Cook Although men often like to cook meat, overall cooking was the most female-based activity of any, a little more so than preparing plant food and fetching water. Women were predominantly or almost exclusively responsible for cooking in 97.8% of societies. The rule that domestic cooking is women's work is astonishingly consistent. The classic reason suggested for this pattern is mutual convenience. Each sex gains from sharing their efforts, as many happily married couples can attest. Non-human primates mostly pick and eat their food at once. But hunter-gatherers bring food to a camp for processing and cooking, and in the camp labor can be offered and exchanged. 
This suggests that cooking might be responsible for converting individual foraging into a social economy. Archaeologist Catherine Perlais thinks so. Quote, the culinary act is from the start a project. Cooking ends individual self Cooking ends individual self-sufficiency. Unquote. Relying on cooking creates foods that can be owned, given, or stolen. Before cooking, we ate more like chimpanzees, every one for themselves. After the advent of cooking, we assembled around the fire and shared the labor. Examples of individual self-sufficiency clearly undermine the idea that the sheer mechanisms of cooking require that it be practiced cooperatively. Why then is the culinary project so often social if it does not need to be? Relying on cooked food creates opportunities for cooperation, but just as important, it exposes cooks to being exploited. Cooking takes time, so lone cooks cannot easily guard their wares from determined thieves such as hungry males without their own food. Pair bonds solve the problem. Having a husband ensures that a woman's gathered foods will not be taken by others. Having a wife ensures the man will have an evening meal. According to this idea, cooking created a simple marriage system, or perhaps it solidified a pre-existing version of married life that could have been prompted by hunting or sexual competition. Either way, the result was a primitive protection racket in which husbands used their bonds with other men in the community to protect their wives from being robbed, and women returned the favor by preparing their husbands' meals. Because females were smaller and physically weaker, they were vulnerable to bullying by domineering males who wanted food. Each female therefore obtained protection from other males wheedling, scrounging or bullying by forming a special friendship with her own particular male. Her bond with him protected her food from other males and he also gave her meat. These bonds were so critical for the successful feeding of both sexes that they generated a particular kind of evolutionary psychology in our ancestors that shaped female-male relationships and continues to affect us today. Among non-human animals, valuable items that cannot be eaten at once predictably induce fights. Most of the fruits eaten by chimpanzees are the size of plums or smaller, too small to be worth fighting over, but a single ripe breadfruit weighs up to 8 kilograms and can take a group 2 hours to eat. An individual does not have time to swallow it before others see the prize and come to compete for it. Offspring take advantage of the situation by begging from their mothers and adults fight to possess whole fruits or large pieces. Among chimpanzees, males win. Among bonobos, females win. In each case, the winners are members of the dominant sex. Many of the foods a woman cooks are edible raw, so they could be eaten before, during or after the cooking process. If a man returns from the bush feeling hungry and has no one to cook for him, he might be tempted to ask a woman for some food or even simply take it rather than doing his own cooking. He can also sneak about the camp at any other time, including night. Yet such tactics are rare. The relaxed atmosphere of Lona Marshall, described for the Kung, is due to a system that keeps the peace at mealtimes among hunter-gatherers and other small-scale societies. Most couples easily develop a comfortable predictability, with wives doing their best to provide husbands their cooked meals and husbands appreciating the effort. Hunter-gatherer women are therefore not normally treated badly, and many ethnographers have concluded that in comparison to most societies, married women lead lives of high status and considerable autonomy. Cooking ends individual self-sufficiency. Cooking need not to be a social activity, but a woman needs a man to guard her food, and she needs the community to back him up. A man relies on a woman to feed him and on other men to respect his relationship with her. Without a social network, defining, supporting and enforcing social norms, cooking would lead to chaos. The food guarding, provisioning by females and respect for possession found in animals are associated with males competing over sexual access to females, but only in humans have they led to households. Something about humans is different from other species. A woman's need to have her food supply protected is unique among primates and provides a sensible explanation for the sexual division of labor. 
Anthropologists often see marriage as an exchange in which women get resources and men get a guarantee of paternity. In that view, sex is the basis of our mating system, economic considerations are an add-on. But in support of the primary importance of food in determining mating arrangements, in animal species the mating system is adapted to the feeding system rather than the other way around. As in many other hunter-gatherer communities, Bonarif attitudes toward premarital sex are particularly open-minded. One girl had sex with every unmarried male in the community except her brother. But when a woman feeds a man, she is immediately recognized as being married to him. Western society is not alone in thinking that the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Among hunter-gatherers who are similarly egalitarian, husbands are liable to beat wives if evening meal is merely late or poorly cooked. When there is a conflict, most women have no choice. They have to cook because cultural rules, ultimately enforced by men for their own benefit, demand it. The idea that cooking led to our pair bonds suggests a worldwide irony. Cooking brought huge nutritional benefits, but for women, the adoption of cooking has also led to a major increase in their vulnerability to male authority. Men were the greater beneficiaries. Cooking freed women's time and fed their children, but it also trapped women in a newly subservient role enforced by male-dominated culture. Cooking created and perpetuated a novel system of male cultural superiority. The Cook's Journey Compared with great apes, we live a few decades longer and reach sexual maturity more slowly. Our long lifespans suggest that our ancestors were good at escaping predators. Across species, those who can escape predators more easily tend to live longer. Tortoises, safe in their shells, have lives measured in decades, far longer than most animals their size. Flying species, such as birds or bats, live longer than those confined to the ground, such as mice or shrews. The longevity of early humans is unknown, but their relative safety during evolution must have owed much to the use of fire to deter predators. Cooked food, being soft, enables mothers to wean their young early. During human evolution, early weaning would have allowed a mother to recover her body condition rapidly after birth, promoting a short interval between births. In addition, the higher energy value of cooked food should have promoted a faster rate of growth for the young. The notion of cooked food making life easier challenges the thrifty gene hypothesis, which claims that because the environments of our hunter-gatherer ancestors were highly seasonal, we are physiologically adapted to periods of feast and famine. Accordingly, ancestral humans supposedly digested and stored energy in their bodies with exceptional efficiency. The thrifty gene hypothesis suggests this efficiency was a useful adaptation when starvation was a consistent threat but is responsible for obesity and diabetes in many modern environments. The cooking hypothesis suggests a different idea. During our evolution, our use of cooked food would have left us better protected from food shortages than the great apes are, or than our non-cooking ancestors were. It implies that humans easily become obese as a result of eating exceptionally high-energy, calorie-dense food rather than from ancient adaptation to seasonality. The opportunity to be warmed by fire created new options. Humans are exceptional runners, far better than any other primate at running long distances, and arguably better even than wolves and horses. The problem for most mammals is that they easily become overheated when they run. After a chimpanzee has performed a 5-minute charging display, he sits exhausted, panting and visibly hot, beads of sweat glistening among his erect hairs as he uses increased air circulation and sweat production to dissipate his excessive heat. Most mammals cannot evolve a solution to this problem because they need to retain an insulation system, such as a thick coat of hair. The insulation is needed to maintain body heat during rest or sleep, and of course it cannot be removed after exercise. This may be why humans are naked apes. A reduction in hair would have allowed Homo erectus to avoid becoming overheated on the hot savanna. But Homo erectus could have lost their hair only if they had an alternative system for maintaining body heat at night. Fire offers that system. Once our ancestors controlled fire, they could keep warm even when they were inactive. The benefit would have been high. 
By losing their hair, humans would have been better able to travel long distances during hot periods when most animals are inactive. They could then run for long distances in pursuit of prey or to reach carcasses quickly. Nowadays, human babies are unique among primate infants in having an especially thick layer of fat close to the skin. Baby fat could well be partly a thermal adaptation to the loss of chimpanzee-like hair. Even our ancestors' emotions are likely to have been influenced by a cooked diet. Clustering around a fire to eat and sleep would have required our ancestors to stay close to one another. To avoid lost tempers flaring into disruptive fights, the proximity would have demanded considerable tolerance. If the intense attractions of a cooked fire selected for individuals who were more tolerant of one another, an accompanying result should have been a rise in their ability to stay calm as they looked at one another, so they could better assess, understand and trust one another. Thus the temperamental journey toward relaxed face-to-face -face communication should have taken an important step forward with Homo erectus. As tolerance and communication ability increased, individuals would have become better at reaching a mutual understanding, forming alliances and excluding the intolerant. Such changes in social temperament would have contributed to a growing ability to communicate, including the evolution of language. Knowing that habilines were able to cut stakes and that chimpanzees often pound nuts with hammerstones, we can be sure that habilines would have had the cognitive ability to batter their meat before they ate it, and they surely would have preferred their meat pounded. Habilines must have also eaten substantial amounts of plant food. During periods of food shortage, such as the annual dry seasons, meat would have been particularly low in fat, down to 1-2%. to Plant foods would have then become critical. By the time of Habilines, brain size had roughly doubled compared with the relative brain size of great apes. It is very likely that Habilines were mentally capable of keeping a fire alive. Anthropologists caution that the sparks produced by many kinds of rock are too cool or short-lived to catch fire. But when pyrites, a common ore containing iron and sulfur, are hit against flint, the result is a set of such excellent sparks that pyrites and flint are standard components of fire-making kits used by hunter-gatherers from the Arctic to Tierra del Fuego. If a particular group of Havilines lived in an area exceptionally rich in pyrites, they could have found themselves inadvertently making fire rather often. Once they kept fire alive at night, a group of Havilines in a particular place occasionally dropped food morsels by accident, ate them after they had been heated and learned that way they tasted better. Repeating their habit, this group would have swiftly evolved into the first Homo erectus. The newly delicious cooked diet led to their evolving smaller guts, bigger brains, bigger bodies and reduced body hair. More running, more hunting, longer lives, calmer temperaments and a new emphasis on bonding between females and males. The softness of their cooked plant foods selected for smaller teeth, the protection fire provided at night enabled them to sleep on the ground and lose their climbing ability, and females likely began cooking for males whose time was increasingly free to search for more meat and honey. While other Havilines elsewhere in Africa continued for several hundred thousand years to eat their food raw, one lucky group became Homo erectus, and humanity began. The Well-Informed Cook Cooking launched a dietary commitment that today drives an industry. The popular foods cooked in giant factories are often scorned as lacking in micronutrients, having too much fat, salt and sugar, and having too few interesting tastes. But they are the foods we have evolved to want. The result is excess. The trends toward easier foods and greater obesity are now found in many industrialized countries. To reverse the decline in health, we should eat more foods with a low caloric density. But few examples can be found in the typical supermarket because we tend not to like them. Nutritional science is focused so intensively on chemistry that physical realities are forgotten. Researchers treat the food entering the stomach as if it were a solution of nutrients ready for a cascade of biochemical reactions. They forget that our digestive enzymes interact not with free proteins, but with a slimy three-dimensional bolus 
which after a meal of meat is a messy collection of chewed chunks of muscle, each piece of which is wrapped in multi-layered tubes of connective tissue. Structural complexity matters because it affects how easily the food bolus is converted to digestible nutrients and therefore how many calories we get from our food. Assessing the energy value of foods is a difficult technical problem. Nutritionists cannot calculate the value of foods directly because foods are too complicated in their composition and structure and digestive systems treat different foods in different ways. For more than a century, the convention that has dominated estimating energy values in foods and now undergirds the food labeling system of the Western world has been the Atwater system. Wilbur Ollen Atwater, who invented it, was born in 1844. Atwater knew that food contained three main items the body uses for energy, protein, fat and carbohydrate. Using a simple laboratory device called a bomb calorimeter, he recorded how much heat was released when typical proteins, fats and carbohydrates were completely burned. Fat dissolves in ether. So Atwater chopped foods finely, shook them up with ether and weighed how much material was dissolved in the ether. That gave him a food's fat content, or more strictly lipid content. Lipids include both fats, which are solid at room temperature, and oils, which are liquid. The same method is used today. Atwater knew that about 16% of the weight of an average protein was nitrogen, so he found a way to measure the amount of nitrogen which gave him the concentration of protein. Atwater knew the main organic matter in foods were the big three items, protein, fat and carbohydrate. He also knew how to calculate the total amount of organic matter. He simply burned the food completely, leaving only the mineral ash that did not burn and was therefore the inorganic part. Knowing how much inorganic matter the food contained and how much fat and protein it held, he observed the amount of carbohydrate by subtraction. The weight of carbohydrate was what was left when the weights of the fat, protein and mineral ash had been subtracted from the total weight of the original food item. Atwater was thus able to estimate the amount of protein, lipid and carbohydrate in his food. The second piece of information he needed was how much of the food a person eats is digested as opposed to being passed through the body unused. This required him to analyze the feces of people who were eating precisely measured diets, which he duly did. There was little variation within the categories of protein, fat and carbohydrate, so he assumed the variation could be ignored. By taking into account the proportion of the food that he found was not digested, which was rarely more than 10%, he claimed that on average proteins and carbohydrates each yield 4 kilocalories per gram, while lipids yield 9 kilocalories per gram. These are known as Atwater's general factors. Nutritionists have long recognized important limitations in the Atwater convention, so it has been modified in various ways. One way was to make the general factors more specific. In 1955, the Atwater specific factor system was introduced to take advantage of a half century of nutritional biochemistry research. For example, the energy value of different types of protein is known to vary. Egg protein produces 4.36 kilocalories per gram, whereas brown rice protein produces 3.41 kilocalories per gram, and so on. An exhaustive list of such variants has been compiled. Although the specific factor system lends greater precision, the overall effects of the changes are so small that some nutritionists, particularly those in Britain, still prefer to use general factors, albeit modified since Atwater's time. The general factors have never been static, more factors have been added over time. Even Atwater modified his own system by separating alcohol into its own category. He gave it a rounded value of 7 kilocalories per gram. Much later, in 1970, a general factor was added for the class of carbohydrates called monosaccharides or simple sugars. New general factors have also been proposed for dietary fiber or non-starch polysaccharides, which are so much less well digested than other carbohydrates that they clearly deserve a lower energy value than 4 kilocalories per gram. A figure of 2 kilocalories per gram has been proposed. The system has also been modified to allow for energy lost in urine and gas production. 
It has two critical problems that undermine its ability to assess the food value of items of low digestibility, such as raw foods or foods like whole grain flour with large particles. The first problem is that the Atwater Convention does not recognize that digestion is a costly process. When we eat, our metabolic rate rises, the maximum increase averaging 25%. The corresponding figures for fish, 135%, and for snakes, 687%, are vastly higher, showing that humans pay less for digestion than other species, presumably due partly to our food being cooked. If food burns in the bomb calorimeter, Atwater seemed to conclude it produces the same amount of energy value in our bodies. But the human body is not a bomb calorimeter. We do not ignite food inside our bodies. We digest it and we use calories to pay for this complex series of operations. The cost varies by nutrient. Protein costs more to digest than carbohydrates, while fat has the lowest digestive cost of all macronutrients. In a 1987 study, people eating a high fat diet achieved the same weight gain as other eating almost five times the number of calories in the form of carbohydrate. We can expect that the costs of digestion are higher for tougher or harder foods than softer foods, for foods with larger rather than smaller particles, for food eaten in single large meals rather than in several small meals, and for food eaten cold rather than hot. Individuals vary too. Lean people tend to have higher costs of digestion than obese people. The Atwater system assumes that the proportion of food digested is always the same, regardless of whether the food is in liquid or solid form, part of a high fiber or low fiber diet, or raw or cooked. Recall that one of Atwater's general factors was the proportion of food that is passed into the feces undigested. He found that this was low, 10% or less, and he assumed that this proportion was constant. This assumption has long been known to be wrong. The digestibility of a grain is affected by how finely it is milled. More extensively milled flour might be completely digested, whereas less milling could lead to 30% of the flour being excreted unused. So they called for specific data to be applied to the digestibility of every food. Such data, however, are often unavailable. Identifying the digestibility of each food according to its physical state is difficult because large numbers of experiments are required. To complicate matters further, the digestibility of the same item varies according to the food context in which it is consumed. Nutrition science is faced with choosing between the immense effort of accumulating nutritional value data that are difficult to quantify but accurate on the one hand, or using easily quantified but physiologically unrealistic measures yielding only a rough approximation of food value. Given the difficulty of acquiring the actual, contextually adjusted nutritional values of individual foods and combination of foods, the general public is provided with estimates of food values that do not reflect the realities of the digestive process. The data in standard nutritional tables assumes that particle size does not matter and that cooking does not nothing to increase the energy value of foods when abundant evidence shows the opposite to be true. We find flour that has been ground ever finer, foods made ever softer, calories in ever a greater concentration. Rough breads have given way to Twinkies, apples to apple juice. Consumers are misled by the current food labeling system into thinking that they will get the same number of calories from a given weight of macronutrients regardless of how it has been prepared. We become fat from eating food that is easy to digest. Calories alone do not tell us what we need to know.